We're going to continue on. We're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 10 and, and uh, begin of the week. As I read through the, the chapter, I was uh, honestly scrapping Nehemiah's uh, journey and we were going to go somewhere else. And we've been doing summer in Psalms and there's a bunch of Psalms that just have spoken. I said, well, you know what, we'll share one of those Psalms. And then the more I looked and, and go over Nehemiah chapter 10, it's the key that we, we need to put everything together. If you've been through the journey of Nehemiah with us, we've seen Nehemiah as a man of prayer, a, a man of a burden, a man of prayer. We see Nehemiah as a man of action uh, going on uh, what God has done in his life. But then we turn, <clears throat> as the wall was complete, we see that the people then called for Ezra to, to read the word of God and under the reading of the Word of God, we saw the sorrow and the brokenness of, of the people. Then we saw that it broke out into prayer, their confession and their prayer. And in the last part of chapter 9, leads us into chapter 10, is we have the children of Israel making a vow to God. And, and when I bring up the word vow, uh, I'd automatically we think of weddings and wedding vows uh, actually was tried to Google and search, don't do it now because somebody will find it while I'm preaching, tried to find some of the, the craziest vows or, or pledges or promises people have made to God. Uh, I guess people aren't like me, maybe I was just the only one, but I remember as a kid growing up, I, was, I wasn't saved and uh, I remember going to school and, and in, in school and uh, call out to God when the teacher passed out a test. Because I know, right, I didn't study and I uh, needed to get uh, to the next grade. And thankfully, I had perfect attendance and my teachers just passed me because they didn't want me uh, in class next year. But, you know, we, I, simple things like this. And, and maybe your mind is like, Lord, if I just pass this test, Lord, I'll do whatever. You know, make some kind of promise to God. And I don't think that's just when we were kids. I was in uh, 12th grade English class. And I told God, I said, God, if you just let this girl notice me and, and, and let her be, see how kind I am to her, Lord, I'll serve you the rest of my life. So almost time we graduated, she, she began talking and let me talk to her. And we've been married 26 years this past week. So that, I made that up, but uh, I probably thought that a few times during English class, but uh, anyhow. But think about vows, think about pledges and promises we make to God. And, and many times we do that when our backs are against the wall. I, I got to thinking about, about it is, is, you know, when things are going good, very rarely are we bargaining with God. Things are going good, we're not uh, bargaining. With God. Usually when pressure hits or something uh, outside hits, then we all of a sudden cry out to God and say, God, if, if you answer this prayer, I'll do such and such. But today we want to see the warning of doing that, but we also want to see the benefit of doing that. We see the children of Israel doing that in chapter 9 and the people signing off on it in chapter 10. And when we get to chapter 10, if you read ahead, you're looking and saying, no wonder we were skipping that. You know, <laughs> all those names there. Rick's going to come in a minute and read. Uh, just kidding. We're going to skip down to uh, the points that we need when we get to chapter 10. But... All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. And, and like I said, he read through it and then realized that, look, there was promises being made. And we look at these four promises, these four vows that the children of Israel made, and we can apply them into our lives today. So hopefully our back's not against the wall. Uh, there was a uh, man, a businessman, he never wanted to fly. I've met people like that. They've, they don't even want to leave the state of Delaware. They don't want to go anywhere. But, but people that uh, have a fear of flying and getting on an airplane, this guy never said he was never going to fly. Well, he got on a plane because of business trip, and he got on that plane, and as he took off, they, everything he was scared, but it smoothed out. He got up to the cruising altitude, and he just smoothed out, and he was relaxed. All of a sudden, a clunk, and the pilot comes on and says, we've lost our engine on the right side and uh, we're going to have to prepare uh, for an early landing. We've got permission to land here, uh, over here. 
Okay, so the guy's getting a little nervous now. He was settled down. They fly a little bit, start to circle around, make their way for the landing. All of a sudden, another clunk. And the pilot says, prepare for a crash landing. We've lost both engines now. The guy cries out to the Lord. He says, oh, Lord, if, if you let me survive this, I'll give you half of everything I have. Just about the time he made that vow, the engines kicked back on. They safely landed, got to the place they were going, and as they're getting ready to get off the airplane, the guy taps that guy on the shoulder and says, hey, I'm a pastor of the church over here, and uh, I want to help you with that half of, uh, of all the things that you have. I'll help you show you where you can uh, invest into God's work. And the guy says, no, me and God had another vow. He said, I vowed to God this time, if I ever fly again, he can have it all. So uh, we see in, in a, time of, a time of emergency, we make some of these crazy vows, and uh, maybe you've done it yourself. Well, just see what the Bible says about vows. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, it says, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear, a man, uh, swear an oath to bind his soul with that bond, he shall not break his word, and shall do according to all that he ha has proceeded out of his mouth. Everything that he said he'd do, he shall not break that bond. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 says, When you make a vow to God, do not delay. When you make that vow to God, don't delay in responding to action to it. Many of us could be guilty of that. God speaks to our heart in a, in a message or through time spending in His Word or just in our, our prayer time. And, and we delay putting that off. And we make, or we make the vow and say, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to start out my day, and Lord, I'm going to spend that first hour of my day with you tomorrow. And then we put that off, and off, and off, and off. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, I think it's up there. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about, about at the end of Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 down. He says again, Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thy oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is, is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make, thy, uh, make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. He say, let your yeses be yes, your noes by noes. What you say you're going to do, say you're going to do it. And that comes with the Lord. As the Lord prompts us and His Spirit leads us, that we respond in the proper way. In Exodus chapter 24, they said, as... as uh, the children of Israel being led by God. They're saying, Lord, we're going to follow you until trial comes, until something comes and, and, and we're going to turn our back. What did they do when Moses went up into the mountain and Moses was meeting with God? Here's the group, of, the children of Israel said, we're going to follow you, we're going to, wherever you lead us, we're going to go. But they built a golden calf at that time. Peter he promises the Lord, he says, hey, everybody will forsake you, but I'll be with you. And the Lord told him what? Before the cock th crows three times, you will deny me. Peter is saying, I'm, I'm going to be with you all the way to the end. So that leads us to a question. Is there any vows for us today? Do, do we make vows? Do we make promises to God? Yes, we do. Is there benefit in it? Yes, it, it helps us to focus. The whole reason we have a invitation at the at the end of the service is a time for us to to make a promise or, or make a vow when the spirit of god speaks to our lives say you know what now i'm going to act upon that 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 spirit has prompted me i'm going to act upon that and whatever it may be that we would act upon so it helps us to focus okay lord you've spoken this into my life you've spoken this into my heart and now i'm going to act upon it and we're focused in that area and then our promises or our vows help us express our love to God. It helps us express our love to God. Think about vows. I said when we talk about vows, we think of our wedding vows. One of my favorite uh, decorations in our house now, 
and I, I've joked about this, but it's, it's pretty serious. Um, I wake up in the morning, my wife decided to redo the bedroom this year, and on our wall, on my side of the bed, is this big, big picture. Uh, or it's not really a picture, it's writings. And it's all vows, wedding vows, uh, real long wedding vows. I'm glad ours weren't that long. <laughs> you know, every time you do a wedding, the guy tells the pastor, say, hey, keep it short, because <laughs> I'm not going to remember everything you say. But, you know, it's good in the morning is to, to read these vows and our commitment to, to one another. They're not the vows we said. Ours were a lot shorter, but they, they are very good, good vows. So, young people, if you're getting married, I'll, I'll use the long version that's on our wall when you get married. But uh, it, it get, brings you comfort. It brings you that reminder of that love that you have. So having said that, you know, many of us never get to that point in our walk with the Lord where we take it to the next uh, level, where we're going to get specific with the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to do this. And, and that's what the children of Israel did is the word of God was proclaimed. They, they broke out. They were broken and then they were comforted, and then they broke up in the, in the prayer, and then we see that they're making a commitment to the Lord. They're making this commitment to Him that they're going to follow Him. They're going to do these four vows that we're going to talk about. The first vow was a submission to His Word. The first vow is, Lord, we're going to be submissive to Your Word. Verse 29 of chapter 10 it says, they clave to the brethren, their nobles, and entered into the curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all, circle, underline, highlight, to do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, uh, Lord, our Lord and his judgments and his statutes, he says. What are they saying? Everything, Lord. We're going to follow everything that you have for us to do. You ever realize the people that God uses? You would think, you know, in our world, and our society today, when you look at sports or you look at just the Olympics, everybody's looking for the, the best of the best, those that are, are fit and trim, those that have dedicated to, to put in the work. Would you look at the super Christians? It, it's not the one that is the superhero. It's not the one that is most religious. It's not the one that has the, the most pedigree behind it. It's the one that simply just surrendered to God. And that's what they're saying here. We're going to surrender to everything, Lord, that you have. Second Chronicles chapter six, uh, 16, verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. That's what the Lord's looking for is those whose heart is perfect. And that starts with the word of God, the word of God, allowing the word of God to saturate our life, allowing the word of God to, to lead in our life. Two chapters ago, it was the word of God that made the change in the children of Israel's life that now they're making this commitment to them to sign off. Not only did they make this vow, but they signed off with it, with the sealing of this vow with a ring. We see, as a congregation, we want to be devoted disciples of Christ. We, we want God to move in a way, if we want God to move in a way, that we have to be fully committed to Him, fully committed to His Word. You know what? Everybody has an opinion. And all our opinions will differ about different things. But we have to have a final authority. And the final authority is the Word of God. That is what brings us together. That's what is sharper than any two-edged sword. God knows the intents of our heart. Not just our thoughts, but the intents behind what we're doing. So we look at what the Lord can do in and through us. William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army, was once asked what his secret was to his ministry. He said, God has all that there is of me. There have been men with greater brains than I. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and caught a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with me and them, on that day I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth. 
And that's what the children of Israel say in, in Nehemiah chapter 10. Is God, you have all of us. God, you have all of us. At your word, we're going to respond. As your word instructs, as your word leads and guides us, we're just going to simply respond to your word. So we ask ourselves, do we make promises when we read God's word? Do we have, a, have we made promises to allow God's word to be important to us? If so, are we keeping our part? Second vow, not only was the word of God, but look with me to verse 28. And the rest of the people and the priests and the Levites, the porters and the singers and the Nethams, uh, and all that had separated themselves from the people of the lands under the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding. And then jump down to verse 30. And that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. We talked about this last week as, as the God's word. They went back to God's word. And he says, you know what? We're not going to intermarry. We've seen the destruction of that. The children of Israel many times have, have gone off. And God had to send them into punishment. They had to go into Babylon and live in Babylon. They come back and they're rebuilding and they're saying right now, we're going to separate ourselves from the world. World, We're totally devoted to the Word of God, and we're totally committed to God and His people. When a man and woman get married, think about it. They separate themselves from all other prospects. You're, you're committing yourself to, to one person. You're giving yourself completely to each other. You're making that vow. And that's what the children of Israel were doing with God. I don't know what, how that hits you, but think about that. How many times have we got our hearts split between the things of God and the things of this world? We were reminded in Sunday school this morning with looking at Paul and Paul being in prison and, and looking at the bonds that he's in, but seeing the furtherance of the gospel because of it. Paul had the right mindset. He had the right mindset. He said, you know, for me to live is... Is, uh, is great, but to die is gain. I gain a whole lot more if I leave this world. So when we get married, we fully commit to one another. We separate ourselves to our mate. The children of Israel had separated now, are making that commitment to separate themselves from all other people around them. <coughs> this wasn't, you know, the people say, well, they become... Uh, ethnically proud. They're, they're just going to be ethnically proud. No, they weren't being proud. They're just being obedient to, to God. And God gives us the same warning today. We've studied it when we're studying 1 Corinthians, and, and He gives us n numerous warnings. If you're young people, you're not married now, heed the advice of the Word of God. Follow God's instructions when you start looking for a mate. Our older children will tell you they've heard that over and over. First thing when they say something to mom about a potential so-and-so, the first question you're going to hear is, what's their testimony? Are they born again? And you say, well, man, you're, you're, narrowing, the, the, you're narrowing the field. Well, wait a second. God's, God's Word gives us the wisdom and, and shows us that there's, there's opportunities that you're going to be pulled one way or the other. It's easier when two are joined together, going the same direction. Now we lift up and look at those that, that aren't equally yoked together. And, and they persevere. We learned in 1 Corinthians that in, in that, your, your walk and your testimony is a testimony to your lost loved one. But look at the two reasons why. Let's look at two reasons. First, there's clear biblical warnings. The ancient world, marriage was an agreement. And when they did, they, they gave offerings to their gods, their pagan gods. Joshua 23 says the heathen spouses would become snares or traps to hold you back in your, in your walk to the Lord. Secondly, there was a historical evidence there. You go through Scripture and look at the evidences that have taken place over and over. 
God's concern is that a believer marry, uh, when a believer marries an unbeliever, that they be pulled down. They be pulled away and compromised, and there be conformity there. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for the fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what common hath light with darkness? I'm sure you could, we could get testimonies of, of people that have made the, the wrong choice. They could, they could tell you the difficulties, the, the snares that the Bible talks, talks about. So those that aren't married yet, think that through. It, it, see that God cares about your spiritual life. God cares about your spiritual life and how it's going to impact your life down the road. So the question is, will, not, will this relationship work out? The question is, can we enjoy God's blessing? Can we fulfill God's will for our life, my life? Honor Him with all our relationships, all our friends. People have influence on us, don't they? The people we hang out with have influence on us. It, be it uh, at, at uh, work, be it at the sports, be it at school, people influence us. So Lord gives us some wisdom. The children of Israel realize after being in bondage to say, you know what, we're not going to do this. We're not giving our daughters over and we're not letting our sons marry over. We're going to keep ourselves together. So after, keep, after pledging themselves to submit to God's word, secondly, they pledge their lives to live separate. You know, that's, that's a stance, that's a difficulty that, that maybe they would face. But they're willing to do it to please God. The third thing we see is that they were going to honor the Sabbath. Verse 31. And if the people of the land bring ware or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell that we would not buy it of them on the Sabbath or on the holy day, and that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. Well, there's a lot, lot in that. He says, first of all, we're going to set aside this day to honor God. We're going to set aside the Sabbath day to honor God. In the New Testament, Jesus rose on the first day of the week. We celebrate on the first day. And I thought about that. You know, we, we can celebrate every day of the week. And I know churches have do, do many schedules and they have many opportunities to worship. And, and then I thought about this as we're reading this of, as a day set apart to honor God. Here's, here's a movement in some churches is we're going to have Saturday night service. Here's the problem with that. It, we, we're just tagging on our Saturday night service to have service that give God a little bit and then go on with our weekend. I, I know good churches that, that do that, and they add it as another opportunity. But really, are we setting aside the day to honor God? A, as they did, to set aside a time to, to relax. We see this se second thing, it was a day of rest. The Lord Himself set the example. God created the heavens and the earth. What did He do? He rested. He set the example of, of resting. There was a, two guys, and the one guy wanted to show off, and he challenged the other guy to a wood chopping. All day, we're going to chop wood for 10 hours today. You get an axe, I get an axe. And we're going to go and see who can chop more wood in a day. Got to get a chainsaw. Forget the axe competition. Get a nice chainsaw. But so they got together and and they did this on a day. And the guy, the first guy that challenged the other guy, he worked hard, and he did nothing but took a break for a little bit of lunch, and he kept working and working. The other guy, every time the guy looked across, he was taking a break. It seemed like every little bit he would take a break and he'd sit there and and be relaxing. This guy said, "Man, this is a shoe win." So after the 10, 10 hours of chopping wood, the guy that challenged the other guy looked and he said, what in the world? 
the other guy outchopped him by double. He said, I don't understand. How did you outchop me? Every time I looked, you were sitting down taking a break. And the guy said, didn't you realize every time I stopped, I was sharpening my axe? Had to take some time to relax, to take some time. And that's the example that the Lord set through is it's, it's a time of re reset. <laughs> we do computers, reset, get back and reset for the week ahead. Thirdly, it was a day to help others as a testimony for them. Fourthly, the Sabbath was a day of uh, declare God's truth. It was a day to get together and proclaim the, the truth of the word of God. <clears throat> so it's important for us today as a church to celebrate the Lord's day, to get together and, and worship the Lord, get to together and, and rest from the, the things of the world, get together and serve our Lord. It's a witness to those around us. Now, we're not talking about legalism and being legalistic about it as a, the Pharisees would, but understand that we're doing it for the Lord. Making Sunday, how can we make Sunday special? How can we honor the Lord? How can we worship the Lord on Sunday? Not only did they do that, but they observed the sabbatical year. Now, there's some farmers here. How would you like to take the seventh year off? On seven year, every seven years, don't plant a crop. What happens if you don't plant a crop? No you don't get paid, right? So the children of Israel are, are saying, we're going to do that. We're going to let the land rest. God, we trust you. That's, they were putting their trust in the Lord, that Lord, you're going to take care of us. See, it wasn't about uh, how much they could get. It was how much they could trust God. They weren't worried about what they could get, how much they could acquire, because guess what? We can't take it with us. But they were showing the Lord that we trust you. They trusted the Lord. So they would rather be obedient. You know, our obedience to God always involves an area of trust. If we're going to be obedient to God, we're going to have to learn to trust Him. And they were showing their trust by taking that year off. The New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be given unto you. Seeking God first. That's what the children of Israel were doing. By doing this, they were seeking God first. And then the third thing they did on that seventh year was they canceled all debt. I know some of you are thinking, let's put that one into practice. <laughs> Forget the rest of them, but we're going to cancel all debt. They cancel all debt. They, it was a reset, and they were saying, okay, we're going to move forward. See, their life wasn't about how much they could get. It wasn't about what we can heap on ourselves. It was about obeying the Lord. And then the, the fourth pledge we see, verses 32 on. You'll see a number of times here. We'll, we'll go through it. Let's see. Also, we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of the house of our God, for the showbread and for the continual meat offering, for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbaths, of the new moons, this, for the set fe, uh, feasts and for the holy things and for sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. And we cast lots among the priests and the Levites and the people for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God after the house of our fathers at the times appointed year by year to burn upon the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law and to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of the trees year by year unto the house of the Lord. Also the firstborn of our sons and our cattle as it is written in the law and the firstlings of our herds and of our flocks to bring to the house of our God unto the priests that minister in the house of God. Over and over in this passage, you see that phrase, the house of God. The fourth pledge is the, the, uh, is the pledge to not forsake the house of God. The pledge was that we're not going to neglect God's house. Now, remember, I've talked about 
Haggai, and when he came and he prophesied, hey, you were worried about your houses. You got God's house started, but you neglected God's house. And, and God used Haggai to rattle their chain and to bring them back focused on the things of God. So we see some insights about this, about their giving. They were given to the house of God. It was responsible given. They took responsibility for the things of God, for God's house, to the upkeep of God's house. Just as they took ownership of their own house, they took ownership of God's house. We just talked about this this week. You realize as a member of New Life Baptist Church, this is your church. It's not my church, it's our church. This is God, God's house. We all take ownership and we all are responsible for the upkeep and the care of God's house. It wasn't only uh, responsible, it was also obedient given. It was obedient. It wasn't an impulse, it wasn't a knee-jerk reaction. It was obedient to God's commands. They came and gave to God uh, the first fruits of their of their uh, of their crops, they gave to God what God required of them. They were just being obedient. They were demonstrating that God came first in their life. The third thing about their giving it was systematic. Verse thirty-two, it says that they gave a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of their God. Verse thirty-four, lots were drawn to determine when families would bring the wood for the offering. 35 tells them that the first fruits were to be brought in. So we see that it was systematic. They had a, a, a collection together. And they did it as God had showed them and prospered them. We talked about this the other week. It was proportionate. I, I, and people will debate on uh, tithing. One thing that tithing does is is proportional giving. You think if the kids... Uh, over the last couple of weeks, my garden was overflowing with tomatoes. And I don't know who came up with the idea. They said, we're going to set it. The kids, the three youngest said, we're going to set a table out front and sell tomatoes. Okay. You won't believe how many tomatoes they sold. You won't believe how much money they sold selling tomatoes at the curb. So much so they're cutting dad out next year. They said, we're, we're planting our own garden. I said, Hey, I spent twenty dollars in plants. Where's my cut? He said, "We're planting. Our, we're taking that and putting buying our own plants next year." They got to buy the land at first, right? <laughs> so, so. And they made a oh, hundred bucks a piece. Yeah, you feel bad for my kids. They're poor, you know. <laughs> but ten percent of a hundred dollars is proportionate to the, those that made a thousand dollars in a week. They gave 10%, you give 10%, it's proportional giving. And, and the Lord lays that out and tells us that, and, and Malachi, where has man robbed God? In their tithes, which is a tenth of what they made, and offerings. I like how Dr. Shoemaker told us, he said, yeah, I believe in tithing for the new Christian. It, it, it's a, it's a, we, we neglect the offering part. So we, we support the church with our tithes and our offerings. Offerings go missions and building funds and other things as the Lord prospers. So we see that they were obedient to God in all these things and even gave God, what, the first fruits of those. It was sacrificial. You know, when, when you have a crop, you know where the first tomatoes went? The first tomatoes didn't go to the curb for the girls to sell. You know where the first tomatoes went? In the house to, for us to eat. It was when there was an abundance and Jen couldn't make any more salsa, couldn't make any more pasta sauce and freeze this and freeze that. They said, oh, we'll know what we'll do. We'll sell them. Come back tonight. I got some extras. You can have them for free. <laughs> or you can come by the house and buy them. But, <laughs> but they gave her the first. They gave God first place there not everybody can give the same amount but everybody can make the same sacrifice it's not equal given it's equal sacrifice listen mother Teresa I don't often quote her but if you give what you do not need it isn't given 
Think about that. If you give what you do not need, it's not given. C.S. Lewis put it this way. I don't believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I'm afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. So it was sacrificial. Sixthly, it was comprehensive. This is the hard... You read When we read in there, not only did they give a third of their silver, first of their fruit, it also said the first animal, their first son. You see that there? They're also the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle. It was every part of their life showing that God was first. God meant more than anything. You know what? God wants it all. And we're going to sing as our invitation song, I Surrender All. And that's a picture of what we have with the children of Israel. It, it wasn't a, a fact of material or possessions, even their children. We don't christen children. We have baptism when somebody makes a public profession of faith we baptize, just as Jesus was baptized, we baptize. But what we do do, and what we've done, in, is we've committed, we've, we've dedicated our children to the Lord. We've dedicated some children here when other pastors were here. Uh, John Edwards was here at one time. We dedicated one of the kids and other pastors. We've had baby dedications. We dedicated some of ours uh, Emma was dedicated First Baptist Church in Newcastle, some in Florida. What, it, what that is, is we're committing. Lord, we're making a vow, we're making a promise that we're going to raise our children to know you. We're going to do everything in our power, Lord, to, to point them to you. We're going to teach the Word of God. We're going to instruct. We're going to lead them along the way. We can do everything but make a decision for them. And that's what the promise, that's the vow that we made here in the, in the children of Israel. It was comprehensive. It was their children. It was their animals. It was their livestock. It was everything. And it was prescribed. They just were being obedient. Verse 37. And that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings and the fruit of, our, uh, fruit of all manner of trees, of wine, of oil, the priests, to the chambers of the house of God, and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites, that the same Levites might have the tithes in their cities of our tillage. It was prescribed that they give the 10% unto the Lord. Hey, the Lord owns it all. And really, the Lord's not concerned about your 10%. He's also concerned about the 90% that you keep. If people say, okay, I'll, I'll tithe. But that means I can do anything I want with the rest of it. No, God's concerned about what we do and how we handle things. It also can be dangerous because people do it just out of, a, out of duty. Remember, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Not out of obligation, out of duty, but out of a cheerful heart unto the Lord. The children of Israel, they got to this point where they're talking about giving to the house of the Lord. Remember, by the word of God by praying and seeking God's face, and they're just ultimately saying, God, we put you first in everything. That's what they're saying there. Given unto the Lord. There's three areas when it comes to giving, three reasons that we give. Here they are. Because we have to. That's under the law. That's being legalistic. That's under the law. Because we ought to. That's obligation or because we want to, and that's grace. Where do you fall in the line? They, these individuals, they, we went through the prescription, but they did it because they wanted to. They, they wanted to show their love to the Lord. So we see the children of Israel submitting to God, making a declaration that they're going to separate from the world. They're going to practice Sabbath rest. They're going to give a time to be a testimony unto the Lord, and they're going to support God's work. As we wrap up, here's another way somebody said you can look at it. You can look at, look at a person's friendship, look at their calendar, and look at their checkbook to determine whether they're fully submitted to God. So as we look at the lesson that from Nehemiah, the children of Israel, 
they make this change after the preaching of God's word, after a time of prayer. They make this vow. They sealed this vow to the Lord. These four vows that we looked at this morning, they made unto the Lord after they realized who they were and whose they were. And I just ask you this morning, as we reflect, has there been any vows that you've broken before the Lord? Anything that you made a commitment or a promise to the Lord and, and we've neglected it? You know what a good thing is? We can go back to the Lord. Remember, he says, don't, don't break your promise. He takes our vows seriously. We need to take them seriously also. Let's pray.